genomics of high risk myeloma is very important because this is the group of uh, subgroup of myeloma where the survival is short. And there are three aspects to the, my talk and presentation here. One is how do we diagnose high risk myeloma? What are the characteristics, uh, uh, biologically speaking, of the disease? And then very briefly, how do we treat them? Do we treat them differently or not? And these are the three areas I have covered. Now, um, basically high-risk myeloma in general is defined as, as those patients whose survival outcome is um, less than two years. And that is changing now because we have so many good drugs that even in this um, uh, high-risk disease, patients are living longer. So mortality within three years um, uh, due to progression of the disease is now considered as high-risk disease. There are various other diagnostic um, uh, uh, criteria or situation which can be considered as patients having high-risk disease. For example, patient with plasma cell leukemia or high LDH or CNS disease. And on the other hand, therapeutically, one can have high-risk disease. Um, for example, when patients get the immunomodulator proteasome inhibitor containing regimen like RVD, where the response rates are close to 99%, if you do not respond, that is a functionally high-risk disease. So having kinetic failure, early relapse, post-transplant also constitute high-risk disease. But greater clarity has come about from our genomic studies, and which is part of my focus here, which is that patients who have certain cytogenetic abnormality are considered as having high-risk disease. So um, uh, most prominent being patients with 17P deletion, patient with translocation 414 and translocation 1416. And an emerging area is 1Q gain, um, uh, and, and that's becoming important. And similarly, 1P32 deletion is another area. And so any patient having this is considered high risk. Now there is also an ISS staging system, stage three um, is considered uh, a poor risk group. And there was a revised ISS staging system which incorporates both the genomic uh, cytogenetic changes with the ISS. And, and, and the way um, the division happens is that patients are called revised ISS one if they have, um, uh, I, they are ISS stage one, and they have normal LDH and normal fish. So that's stage one. The RISS stage three are people with ISS three with either abnormal LDH and or abnormal fish. And the rest are in the middle is ISS two. And, and so these are the commonly utilized thing. And one of the important points that we must keep in mind about the, the, the uh, mm, role of cytogenetics is that the clonality matters. Uh, Professor Ravi Lovazo had a very good present publications, uh, uh, more than one, where he shows that se having 17P alone is not enough to call it a bad disease. It has to be, if it is in more than 60% of the cells, that carries poor prognosis. If it is less, it is not as uh, adverse prognosis as otherwise. And, and, and this we have to keep in mind that we may need to do in our practice, looking at the clonality of 17P and its, its importance. There has been publication about what is called double hit myeloma, um, where patient with P53 deletion, if they also have P53 mutation, so both P53 are abnormal or missing, that's a bad myeloma or worse myeloma. There is also, um, mentioned that if patient has ISS stage three with amplification of one Q with more than three copies, uh, that that's another double hit. And they, in one study, had poor outcome. These are the markers which we need to have further confirmation, et cetera, but this is what we are looking at. What additionally I presented and, and um, is important to keep in mind that we are now using more newer technology to better define these patients. Uh, Gene expression profile has been significantly used, uh, um, and now um, sequencing, uh, DNA sequencing has been used. And one of our study uh, published by Nicolo Boli uh, a few years ago showed that if there are high number of mutation, 
um, it carries poor prognosis. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Samur, um, Mehmet uh, Samur, um, also presented at ASH recently that uh, if, if, you, if you do whole genome sequencing, and if you have high number of overall mutation, that carries bad prognosis. So I think we have to keep those things in mind um, that increased number of mutations are, uh, can adversely reflect on the disease uh, phenotype and genotype, meaning those are genomes with unstable DNA, able to recombine and overcome treatment effect and relapse. And so we have to keep that in mind. Um, I did present significant uh, data from uh, uh, Dr. Samur's work um, showing how these mutations could be so very frequent when you do whole genome sequence. The earlier studies were with exome sequencing, where median number of mutations were around 50, 55. Now, using whole genome, the number is closer to 7,000. So, so we have much better granularity. An additional important point also is that what causes this mutation, and they may be responsible for um, poor outcome, not just the mutation, but what causes those mutations to be acquired by cancer cell. And in that regard, so we had previously published that um, Epobec uh, family of uh, genes um, play a critical role in inducing the mutation. And in this regard, so you could also have um, another marker for disease where um, high Epobec activity could be prognostic. Um, and, and there have been publications in that regard subsequently. And so, so I think uh, um, uh, more recent work by Dr. Samur shows that there are a number of such signatures of mutation. And one that has been most prominent in his work has been <clears throat> those which are connected with DNA repair pathway. And abnormalities of those, um, either over function or under, um, can be deleterious uh, uh, and make those disease high-risk disease, and, and so we have to keep uh, that in mind. And, and in our own study, we are looking at various uh, of these DNA repair pathways, like homologous recombination, epobec activity, nuclease activity, uh, NER, uh, uh, and nuclear excision repair, and others, um, and also trying to develop them as biomarkers for high-risk disease, but at the same time trying to come up with methods to inhibit uh, these pathways, which may actually make the high-risk disease um, a standard risk, um, or they can be better managed. And the final point would be, how do we treat this patient? Do we treat the same way, or do we treat differently? Um, for, the, for the sake of time, I would expand it, but it's very important in the practical sense. Um, so one of the things we use is, uh, that if patient has a high risk disease, say patient has a 414 translocation and 17p deletion, really high risk disease. Um, this is where in United States, for example, we consider novel agents early. This is the area where there is great interest in using four drug regimen. So we may give RVD with a CD38 antibody, and that's very important part. This is the area where there is data that high dose chemotherapy does help. Now, there has been this impression that transplant doesn't work in high-risk disease, and that's not correct. It is that it does not ex help to the same extent that it helps uh, um, to the standard risk disease, but it still makes a difference. So high-dose therapy should be considered and probably should be considered earlier on, not delayed. And then um, uh, maintenance for high-risk disease, for example, we use um, uh, both proteasome inhibitor and immunomodulator for maintenance, not just one which is immunomodulator commonly. And I think we have to keep this in mind. Also, um, uh, knowing this, um, uh, we, there, is, there is some data from our works and others that if you get MRD negativity, we can overcome the high risk uh, features of the disease. And so the emphasis is to get MRD negativity. And, and this is another thing I would suggest uh, we should keep an eye on. So there should be some algorithm of how do we estimate the risk, keeping in mind that when a diagnosis patient is not high risk does not mean that high risk features may not evolve. So that's my last point here, that the risk may evolve. So standard risk patient five years ago might behave as a high risk because now he has acquired 
uh, uh, 17 p dilation and or some other changes which may put the patient in that category so we have to keep it in mind we may need to do genomic study multiple times and then uh, address um, that uh, in treatment accordingly <laughs>